Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 609 of the podcast, and it is Sunday the 13th of March 2022 as I record this. On today's show, I talk to Dan Holloway about improving your creativity, goal setting and personal reinvention, neurodiversity, augmentation with technology and much more. I've known Dan for over a decade and he always has interesting perspectives on various things. He helped me research my book Delirium, which is a modern crime thriller based on the history of psychiatry and we talk a lot about mental health issues. He's also written a chapter in The Healthy Writer on writing with depression and how writing community rules like write every day really just don't apply to so many people. He also has a chapter in my book, Public Speaking for Authors, Creatives and Other Introverts, about performing your work. So clearly I value Dan's opinion and I'm thrilled to bring him back to the show today. You can also hear Dan on the Ask Ally podcast, where he is a co-host with Howard Lovey on self-publishing news. So that is coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing news, well, Brandon Sanderson's Kickstarter is now over 28 million US dollars and it still has a few weeks to run and I'm certainly loving it. I wasn't a fan of his work, but I now I have supported it as part of this Kickstarter and I've actually started reading. He put the first chapter of one of his books and I was like, do you know what? I actually really like this. (laughs) So I might be a new fan. And so, of course, many of his fans, and my husband is a long term fan and celebrating his success. And many authors who understand business and the independent way of things are celebrating because we see how this works. But there has been much hand wringing and quite a lot of negativity. And at first I was kind of confused about that. But I guess it challenges many of the myths uh, we have to tackle as indies in a much smaller way, of course. Now, Chris Rush talks about some of the early responses on her blog at chriswrites.com and quotes the New York Times. Self-publishing on the scale Sanderson is proposing is an enormously complicated proposition. Fundamentally, most authors want to write books, not run a publishing house. (laughs) And the article was just full of pronouncements. Um, So Chris says, traditional publishers use the money from the books they publish to pay for their buildings, to pay for their staff, to pay for manufacturing and distribution of the books, and yes, sometimes to pay for marketing, but they do less and less of that. Once upon a time, writers absolutely needed those services. It was as cost heavy as the New York Times, mired in the past, seems to think it is now. There were, warehouse, there were warehousing costs and the cost of using a press and physically driving books to a distributor and distributing those books all over the country. But there are other ways to do those things now. And that's just the physical books. Uh, and I've supported the Kickstarter for the ebooks only. And my husband, Jonathan, has supported it for ebooks and audiobooks. Neither of us have gone with the print. So the, although print is a big part of Brandon Sanderson's uh, Kickstarter, we've just done the digital side. Brandon was right in his post, Chris says, something fundamental has changed. But the change happened a decade ago. <laughs> Many of us realised it then and have been working in the indie publishing field ever since. This is a very big deal for all of us. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm i working with some uh, traditional publishing authors at the moment and their questions are things like, oh, don't you need weeks in order to publish the ebook? And I said, well, no, uh, as long as I have all the things in place, like the, the files, which I can make a file in vellum in a few minutes and I've, we've got the covers and I just upload them and it takes me not very much time at all. I've done it so many times. Of course, when you do these things the first time, it takes a bit longer. And we have so many freelancers who most many of whom come out of traditional publishing and you can pay freelancers to do the publishing side if you want help and you can definitely do that if you're making an eight-figure payday. (laughs) So Brandon is clearly a real author. He wrote four surprise fantasy novels for goodness sake on top of all his other things that he does uh, for traditional publishing 
And he also now runs a publishing company to deliver on his Kickstarter. You can do both. You can be a real author and also run a business. Now, I think, now, of course, (laughs) not all of us are going to be as big as Brendan. But in my mind, it could be the beginning of a company that is equivalent to Pottermore, founded in 2012. So again, a decade ago, in the beginning, the beginnings really of the ebook era, J.K. Rowling did not sign her digital rights over to her publisher. She used them when everyone else signed the addendum of, yeah, can you just sign this, please, Uh, giving us your digital rights and uh, we won't give you any extra money. (laughs) We just want your rights. She didn't sign it. She started Pottermore. If you go to a Kindle version or audiobook version of the Harry Potter books, you'll see they're published by Pottermore. And this is obviously now a rights licensing business, everything from pencil cases, which you see, I see down the road, um, to theme parks theme park rides and stuff like that. So I wonder if Brandon Sanderson has similar ambitions. His intellectual property is incredible. His fans love him. He's His work is brilliant. My husband is one of those fans. And Brandon may see the value of rights licensing through his own company in the future. Now, most of us will not hit those heights. We have not spent 20 plus years writing and cultivating fans in a very specific niche. And of course, you need an edge of ambition too. But um, yeah, I I think this is the beginning of something very interesting. <laughs> anyway, let's also remember that Kickstarter and direct book sales is one form of income. And the self-publishing advice blog from the Alliance of Independent Authors has this week has the ultimate guide to multiple streams of income. And it's really good. It goes into active versus versus passive streams of income, how to keep cash flow going while you work on your backlist and grow your intellectual property assets, lots of ideas for income streams, how patience is key if you want to make your author business work for the long term, and tips from authors on various things that they do. So that's on selfpublishingadvice.org, links in the show notes as ever. So I'm going to combine my personal section with futurist this week. And uh, if you if you don't enjoy the futurist side of things, skip forward a few minutes because <laughs> you, you don't want to miss the interview with Dan. But I am going to talk about things like blockchain, crypto and NFTs <laughs> because something happened this week that I think is pretty big. A lot of people think is pretty big and it means there will be an acceleration in this space. So President Biden in the USA signed an executive order and the, uh, about block, blockchain, crypto, etc. And The Verge reports, the order legitimizes digital assets by treating them as worthy of measured regulation. It instructs agencies to develop policies that will protect consumers, investors and businesses, as well as guard against systemic risks. And it also directs the Department of Commerce to figure out how to keep the US competitive in the development of digital assets. This is a big deal because it's essentially saying regulate. And it's also saying, figure out how we can use this. So I've talked before about central bank digital currencies. And uh, I've mentioned the Bitcoin, which we've, which has been talked about in the UK. And I think the US signing this executive order, which is like, go and look at this, but it legitimizes it. Who would have thought that the president of the United States would sign an executive order legitimizing crypto? Even, I don't even know, a few weeks ago, people were saying it will just get destroyed in some way. Um, But no, this is this is a big deal. And I feel like I'm I'm very interested, as you know, in this space as a as a business person. I am not a crypto utopian. I don't actually think that this will all be decentralized. I think there will be different things that we will use. But I do think that blockchain and cryptocurrencies, even if that cryptocurrency is a digital dollar or a digital pound, a Bitcoin, then uh, there will be different currencies as we have right now. We'll use wallets like I use Apple Pay and I have an Apple wallet. I'll use my crypto wallet. And there will be a lot of infrastructure built in this space. So the the days of the sort of world west crypto will recede, similar to the early days of the internet, when people just did anything and the rules were 
unsure. And of course, that is brilliant in many ways, but it will never be mainstream while it sits in the Wild West days. And with regulation, we're going to see the development of a lot more platforms that will be more easily used by more people. This to me is essentially the beginning of Web3 going mainstream. And you may not even know the platforms you use in the future use blockchain architecture. You will just use it. For example, Stripe, who many of us use for uh, for example, if you buy from me direct at payhip.com forward slash the creative pen, your payment might go through Stripe. And Stripe have just uh, introduced integration with cryptocurrencies. So what we're thinking about is what will the architecture of Web3 look like? And what this executive order does is essentially say this is a direction. This is a direction we need to investigate and it legitimizes it. So <laughs> that galvanized me into action because even though I've been talking about this for a year and look at obviously I've been sharing things I have not minted an NFT but I did on Friday <laughs> so on Friday I minted my first NFT you can find it on opensea.io forward slash jfpen or I've also set up a page on my website jfpen.com forward slash nfts so nfts the and links in the show notes as ever. So the book NFT platforms are still in development. So I used AI generative art, which I've been playing with for ages and just love it. So with AI generated art, basically I combined one of my photos. So in 2006, I went to Varanasi in India and the burning ghats where they uh, burn bodies on the banks of the Ganges inspired the opening scene of my first novel, Pentecost, later republished as Stone of Fire. So, and what I used was, so I used a picture from Varanasi, my own picture, with a prompt of the first line of Stone of Fire, which is... Rain soaked the ashes of the dead into the winding Varanasi streets as rivers of mud ran down to the holy river Ganges. So I used that line with my own image to create AI generated art, which I then remixed and did various things with. Uh, and I used um, Pseudo Make, which is part of, well, owned by Pseudo Write, which I've talked about before. And the image is the NFT, and then attached to it, using what OpenSea calls unlockable content, is a special edition of the ebook of Stone of Fire, which includes a picture of me <laughs> going, This is my first NFT, <laughs> and talking about it. And there's a smart contract attached to it that says I get 5% on any resale. And uh, if you listen if you've listened to or you're going to listen to because this week I will put out my um, presentation on audio so yeah so five percent on any resale it's my first one <laughs> so I'm pretty excited now I use OpenSea people have said why did you use OpenSea uh, it's kind of known as the Amazon of NFTs so I was like right I'm just going to use the platform they also have a lot of art and I've put this well the art category is pretty much that there is no publishing category right now so I've used art and it is a piece of art because the NFT is the image uh, I chose the Polygon blockchain which is less energy intensive than Ethereum but it is priced in ETH so yeah, I mentioned uh, I've been playing with AI generative art for a while now. I mentioned Wombo Dream on the podcast a while back. And uh, I because I use PseudoWrite, I got access to their pseudomake.art beta. And I love that I can use my words and my images combined with AI to create something new. And I in um, the AI assisted author course, I cover AI generative art in a whole uh, lesson and I think it's easier to understand how AI prompting works with a medium you don't excel in. So I actually think that you guys as authors should actually try AI generative art because it will help you understand prompting and then you can take that back to writing and it will help you understand that the AI is not the thing. You are the thing. You direct it. You curate it. I mean, I created probably 60 plus images and did lots of remixing and things to create the one I decided was what I wanted to mint. So it's not just a bang, there you go. Anyway, back to the AI assisted author. Remember, you can get 50% off my courses right now. Uh, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash learn, and you'll find the AI assisted author. And with the coupon March 22, all caps, you can get that for basically under $100. So uh, I think it is a good course. <laughs> 
So I am planning on minting some more NFTs in the next few weeks. I It's like I've been waiting and waiting and now I'm like, right, I'm just going to play with this. I'm not going to, I am taking it seriously on the one hand and on the other hand, I am not taking it seriously. I didn't know what I was doing when I started podcasting. I did not know what I was doing when I first uploaded onto the Kindle. I, I oftentimes don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> But I give it a go and see what happens. And now I'm like, right, I just need to do this. So yes, minted the first NFT. And as the platforms come online for the books, I'm going to mint on other platforms. So I've gone from like, I'm waiting for the perfect platform to I'm just going to try a few things. And yeah, so we will see. This is, I feel like it's the beginning now. It's almost day one, (laughs) as Jeff Bezos always said. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to add my NFT tutorial video to the audio feed uh, in order that you guys can listen. I realise that most, well, you are a listening audience and I did that presentation on video, but uh, I want you guys to be able to listen easily. I also have, I'm going to have a couple, I've got, I've got like a lot of in between episodes coming in this space. I think it's very important that we now get to grips with this. I don't think it's futurist anymore. I think it's going to be... I mean, it is futurist in that it's not mainstream right now, but I want us to understand the implications and the contractual implications right now. So I have, um, uh, I've recorded the conversation. I've got an interview coming with an intellectual property attorney to talk about the implications of what you might sign in a publishing contract and how that might impact NFTs and also DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations in the future for authors, because you don't want to sign something now that is going to prevent you minting NFTs later if they become become what we think they're going to become. So that's all coming up. I realise I'm putting out a lot of content right now and I hope you understand it's because I'm just so fired up in this space and I want to um, inform you and help you and empower you with the knowledge to do it too. I also wanted to mention the Crypto Business Podcast with Michael Stelsner, which uh, is on your podcast app. It's really good. Mike is also a newbie to the space. And actually, he's only got, there's only a few episodes. He started it in January. So he's asking a lot of questions that newbies ask. And in fact, listening to his show has helped me realise how much I know about this now. I keep feeling like I don't know enough, but I know enough to get on with this. It's also another canary in the coal mine moment for me, because back in 2009, when I was really early in this space, uh, in the self-publishing space, Mike Stelzner started Social Media Examiner. And I'm sure many of you know that website, uh, podcast, blog, courses. They have um, a live event or they did have a live event before before COVID. So basically, I learned about social media, which is Web 2, the social web, uh, what we know as Web 2 now, I guess. Um, I learned a lot from Mike in the early days of Web 2. And he, there is no need for him to get into Web 3. I'm sure he's built up a lot of money in a really good business. But he has seen that this is going to be the next iteration. And he built his business on Web 2. And he sees, like I do, that I'm going to have to build this again in Web 3. And it doesn't mean that the old ways disappear. I think Brandon Sanderson's a really good example, coming back to that. The old way of making a physical book and shipping it to someone in the post, that's not going away. The in inverted commas, old way of going to a bookstore is not going away. And I've mentioned I'm doing book binding classes at the moment. I want to make physical books and put them in the post. I mean, really, that's super old. (laughs) I'm going to use some, oh, just, I'm very excited about that too. More on that another time. But at the same time, we'll have, um, so that might be, let's say that's not even web one, that's analog. (laughs) And then of course, we're going to have the web two stuff will still go on, we're we're still publish on the existing platforms. But what we're also going to see is the emergence of the web three platforms. And so yeah, I feel like Mike's podcast crypto business because he has such a huge reach. He has a huge, huge email list and a massive audience on social media examiner, he's going to push this too into the mainstream. So yes, that's the Crypto Business Podcast. So in terms of writing and uh, sorting out our intellectual property assets, I got Crypt of Bone, the rewrites back from my editor. um, And people have asked what I'm using an editor for in this case. I'm using a human because I've used ProWritingA, but I'm using a human, (laughs) a human, (laughs) the wonderful Kristen, (laughs) uh, to 
go through and obviously there's a style guide and uh, she has human type comments which uh, pro writing you would never pick up and so it's not like a detailed edit it's more like a line edit for sense and anything I might have missed than a really detailed edit I'm I'm now into the hand edits of Ark of Blood which is the third in the trilogy it, it, the first three books are tied together more with um, they can be read as a, as a more of a trilogy I suppose but they're all standalone because you can I, you can pick up the the story threads but um yeah, I feel like once I've done the three, and again, I can feel the arc of blood, I started to understand what I was doing far more. So the edits on these, uh, the second, the book two and book three are much easier. Uh, and then, of course, once I've, so I'll finish the rewrites by the end of March or before then, get it edited, put them out. So middle of April, I'm expecting to turn my ads back on and see what my read-through rate is and see if I have actually amplified my read-through rate. But as I said, I'm happy I've done it anyway. And then I'm going to start working on how to write a novel. Yes, I am. <laughs> that is my commitment. Don't let me not do this. I really, I need to write that book. Seriously. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Kate Zarena says, great episode. Love when Dharma reminded us to toot your own horn because otherwise someone will use it as a spittoon. Uh, yes, very good point. Also, LGQ or LEGQ says, thank you so much for this conversation. I think Dharma is a very wise person. Love for writing and the process should come first. Best from Colombia. Always love to hear where you are in the world, people. Remember, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I've been thinking I so need to get out and travel more. I know we went to New Zealand, but it didn't count. If you have to travel anywhere for family, you know that that doesn't count as travel. It counts as family. <laughs> The fact that it was on the other side of the world still didn't count. <laughs> and also SL Hansen sent a lovely picture from the farm saying, listening to the show while doing cattle chores, another author with a March birthday. Happy birthday, SL. You can tweet me at The Creative Pen. Send me pictures of where you're listening or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog, in the show notes or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. One way to reach a new audience on Kobo is through their subscription reading service, Kobo Plus. This program has been a great success and is now available to readers in Canada, Belgium, the Netherlands, Portugal, France, Italy, Australia and New Zealand. The great thing about Kobo Plus for authors is that it reaches an entirely new audience who may be trying digital reading for the first time. The Kobo Writing Life team know how important it is that authors retain control of their books. And as such, exclusivity isn't required. And this is really important. I'm just breaking out of my ad read to say, Kobo Plus, you don't have to be exclusive. So if you're wide, then definitely, why wouldn't you sign up for Kobo Plus? Do you want to try out a book in Kobo Plus Canada, but not in the Netherlands? You can do that. So you can opt in by area in the rights and distribution section of your book. Personally, I'm I'm just everywhere. I'm super wide, wide, and are including all territories for Kobo Plus. If you're choosing to publish wide as an author, Kobo encourage you to make your books available to as many readers as possible. And with Kobo Plus, it's a great way to gain and build an audience. Don't want to opt your books in one by one? The KWL team can bulk opt in your books. So if you've got lots of books, email them at writinglife at kobo.com. Or in fact, if you have any questions about or you want to add the promotion, Promotions tab, for example, if you're on Kobo, you need the promotions tab. And if you if you publish direct through Kobo Writing Life, get the promotions tab too. So yes, email writinglife at kobo.com. And if you want to learn more about KWL and Kobo Plus, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast available wherever you get your podcasts on the app you're listening right now and find them on social. Create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. So this kind of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time and my enthusiasm often 
is supported by my patrons, my wonderful patrons. Thanks to new and returning patrons this week, Cat Powers and Scott Stroud. And to thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. And uh, once I minted, I let my patrons know and uh, I'm answering questions there on the uh, Patreon account. And you can, I do a QA and a uh, answering my patron questions every month which you can get and all the backlist if you support the show for just a few dollars or whatever your currency is they do tons of different currencies now support the show at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen right let's get into the interview Dan Holloway is the author of nine books across dark fiction, poetry and non-fiction, a performance poet, professional speaker, podcaster and creativity consultant. He's won the Creative Thinking World Championships three times, as well as the World Intelligence Championship. He's also the founder of Rogue in Terrorbang, dedicated to helping individuals and companies expand their creativity. So welcome back to the show, Dan. Hi, it's it's fabulous to be back after many, many years. Many years, I know. We were just saying before I hit record, it was 2013 since you last came on the show. And I'm going to assume that most people possibly haven't heard that episode. So <laughs> let's um, let's start with the basics. Tell us a bit more about you and your author journey and, and how it's progressed. Right. So I I was one of the very... I guess early self-publishers back in the days. I judge myself by the title of the, on Smashwords. In the olden days, you used to get a forward slash and then the number of the book according to which which in order you were. And I had my books were all in three figures, so I was amongst the first few hundred books published on Smashwords. So that's how I judge myself as sort of an, an early indie author. Back in those days, in sort of two thousand and six, seven, eight, I was writing all sorts of thrillers, literary fiction. And after that, I got into poetry, performance poetry, spent quite a long time on the slam scene. And obviously that has been harder of late. The last two years, there hasn't been much sort of in-person slam poetry. Mm. Um, Most recently, I've gone back to my absolute roots in in writing non-fiction. When I say my, my absolute roots, when I was a kid, I, I grew up as most people, I don't want to say our age, but my, my age, as most people my age did, my hero was Carl Sagan. So that was what I always wanted to do. I was given a copy of Cosmos when I was, I think it was my eighth birthday when the hardback came out. I read that and I decided that was the kind of thing I wanted to do. I wanted to be the kind of Carl Sagan figure, sort of this, this public intellectual, for want of a better word. So it feels like writing nonfiction now has gone back to those roots. That's really interesting. I mean, obviously, the performance poetry scene, as you say, because of the pandemic, has has kind of dropped off in person. But uh, in my mind, it's funny. Obviously, we've known each other through various incarnations of ourselves. But in my mind, you're always a performance poet. That's how I think of you in my mind. I see you performing. But it's funny because you say they're public intellectual and you've won these creative thinking championships and and you do have a sort of almost polymath uh, ability to explore things. So are, is the poetry side and the performance side, is that going to come back into your life, do you think? Or do you think I, that was part of it? Absolutely. And, and mm. per- performance is very much still there with nonfiction. And that goes with the, the sort of the public intellectual thing, I think. I, I love the kind of the kind of engagement speakers. So, so the sci, I don't know if you know the SciCom community, for example, science communications, um, and people who are just who who speak passionately and present incredibly well their nonfiction work. I think that there's a real performative element to that, that. That I love to bring those sides of what I do in, and I'm very lucky being still in Oxford. We have quite a lot of people who, who are exploring this space and quite a lot of funding for projects that explore this space where you get experts who work with creatives to create fabulously uh, multimedia performative ways of communicating information. And that really excites me, sort of bringing those two sides, the performance side and the nonfiction side together. So I, I spend a lot of time analyzing really really good performances and the structure of it um so things like the hero's journey and and how that relates to really well put together youtube videos all, all this kind of thing about 
communication, storytelling, performance, narrative, non-fiction, all, how all these things tie together in order to, in a way of getting an idea across and getting people excited about something. I think that's so important because in many, in the, in the indie space, there's progressively become more of a focus on you can only be successful if you write in a genre type of thing. Mm -hmm. And yet (laughs) where I see your career and mine as well is that we just can't, well, we can't and we don't want to do that. You'd like, don't put me in a box kind of thing. I know, I know. (laughs) And what I love there is you're talking about nonfiction and speaking, which many people see as like one side over here and then creativity and poetry and fiction and they all come together, don't they? They don't have to be so siloed. No, absolutely, they they do, and I think this is one of the exciting things, as I say, about the rise of high value YouTube um, streaming services. There, there are more, and I, I think we'll probably spend some time talking about VR later. There are all these ways in which these things are starting to come together in a single space, and and there is an opportunity for people who want to explore lots of different things together. And as I say, we're very lucky here in Oxford. I'm a co convener of the the Futures Thinking Network, which and we do a lot of this here. We get people who are academic experts in a field and then we combine them with creatives and we do multimedia performances. We give talks, we give public engagement and you're never exploring any one thing at a time. You're always exploring more than one thing in any project you do. And I think there's immense value to doing that. Um, the sort of multiple, the idea that, that you're never looking at a single point you're never looking at a single focus, but you're always trying to balance things. And that I find creatively is incredibly sort of empowering and liberating. Yes, and underlying it all is creativity. And of course, you have uh, one of your books, which is called Our Dreams Make Different Shapes. It is about creativity. So first of all, how do you define creativity? Because sometimes it's a bit nebulous. I use a really simple but really effective definition, which is just that it's new stuff <laughs> to be to be slightly more expansive, bringing something new into the world. And that can either be a thing or it can be a work or it can be simply an idea. And almost always you're not creating something out of nothing. It's it's a new way of joining things up that haven't been joined up in that way together. So that's, I think, probably a slightly more traditional way of looking at creativity. It's, It's new connections. But you you said they're an idea, but in my mind, in terms of we're talking to authors and you said uh, creating new stuff. But to me, it's the execution, not the idea. Like people have loads of ideas all the time. But until you execute that and create something that actually exists new in the world, the idea is kind of meaningless. It is. Yeah, that's that's a difficult. I'm not sure how much creating an idea or putting an idea into the world in a new way, I think, is creative. A lot of what we think of as creativity, I think, is an extremely skillful. I'm going to say art because I don't think art and creativity are the same thing, art and technique. So I think creativity is, is often the first step in a process. But you're absolutely right. And one of the things I talk about in the book and when I give talks is, is what I call the Cassandra curse, um, which is that it's not enough simply to come up with a good idea. You have to get that idea somehow implemented in the world. And creative people are very, very good at having the best ideas that never then get made and nothing gets done with them. And in particular, the more original your idea, the less likely people are to listen to it. And that's one of the problems that we face with creativity in general and, and authors in particular face because we have to convince people to buy it the next thing they read has to be ours. Why Why should it be ours rather than someone else's? And the mm. more different it is from, from everything else on the shelves, the harder sell it is in that way. Yes, the, the perennial issue. But I do actually like there that you've kind of separated the idea of creativity and then skillful art. So the creativity is the ideas, all the ideas that we have. And the reason almost that we want to write a book is because we have all these ideas and they're running around in our heads and they're kind of making us a bit crazy. And then we try it with like, we're, they're amazing ideas. And then you try and write them down. And that's really, really hard. Because, and that's really, really hard. Yes. Yeah, I think, that's, the, I think... that's the hard bit. I think creativity in that sense would be writing something in a new way, whereas most of what we do is art, after we've had the idea is art, uh, it's following something that we've spent years or decades learning how to do and chiseling it into that that thing that is then 
puts it out in the world. I'm not sure that's creative, but it's incredibly valuable and it's the hardest part of the process. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's just wind it back to the idea section, because I still remember when I had my day job, you know, back in the day (laughs) in accounts payable departments. (laughs) And and I still remember feeling I don't have any ideas. I could never write fiction. I don't have ideas like that. Those writers, they're amazing. I could never be that. Uh, People still email me saying they feel that way. So if people listening, if anyone feels like they don't even have creative ideas, how do they improve that intellectual muscle, I guess? Oh, that's really interesting. One of the most one of the most enjoyable things I do when I teach creativity is I, I work with some writers groups here in Oxford. And the the principle I teach is that to think of creativity as I guess a second order rather than a first order skill. So it's, it's a proper soft skill. And I think part of the problem with creativity is that people treat it, they talk about it as a soft skill, but treat it as a hard skill. So it's not about technique, it's about re- rewiring your brain. So, that, so the drills I do with people using, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to plug my, my game, my creative thinking game. My yes, CD, please do. Um, which, which I developed to look at, I think of it like, imagine you're a sprinter. A key part of your training is to, to get stronger. So you would do squats, you do bench presses. You don't go out on the track. The, sit on the starting block, stand on the starting blocks, the gun goes off and you start doing squats and bench presses. But without doing squats and bench presses, you can't do the running. And I think of creative, the creative thinking drills I do in that way, the behind the scenes training to get your brain so that your brain is in a more receptive state and a more fluid state for forming ideas. Um, so it works with two, two ideas that come out of neuroscience. One is based on this the really famous study of, of cab drivers that I'm sure you've come across. I'm sure mm-hmm. your listeners have come across, which showed that when cab drivers study the knowledge to become a London black cab driver, you have to learn to navigate your way around the streets of London in your head and getting around, finding the shortest route between any two places, knowing where all the diversions are, knowing where all the landmarks are. And the training involved in that actually changed the shape of the hippocampus area of these cabbies brains which is really interesting and the study that found that has been backed up by studies into memory training that basically this kind of highly sensory highly visual way of almost training your brain to to perform this kind of navigation task um, will increase the, the the matter in the part of your brain that we associate with with creativity. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is some fascinating studies on jazz musicians and battle rappers, which showed that when they started improvising, um, literally the whole of the front of their brain, the the sort of the the thinking slow part of your brain, the new part of your brain in sort of Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast, thinking slow model, the self-sensor, the executive functioning bit of the brain, it switched off. Um, And everything reverted to the the motor part of the brain, the the sort of what people call the lizard brain, the old fashioned part of the brain. And that was the key to to improvising was was that that they were able to switch off the bit of the brain that's self-censored. So what I do with writers is I give them exercises to literally work on those two parts of the brain. So highly sensory, navigatory, knowledge seeking exercises to to increase the grey matter in the brain and then using the dopamine system by playing a game that rewards original thinking to make it easier for us to switch off our self-sensor and therefore to that bit of us that stops us going places. You know, when you have an interesting idea and you think, oh, no, I mustn't go there. Mm. It it, enables us to switch that off and be more exploratory. So so it's the way I help writers to to cut it short would be to, to say it's, I'm the equivalent of the personal trainer that gets the sprinter in the gym doing the basic weight training to prepare the body for what happens on the track. And in in that way, I I do the basic things that prepare the mind for what happens when people want to generate ideas. So it's not about process. And a lot of creative thinking training is about the process of writing, how you go about getting more ideas for a book. It's much more what I do about getting people's brains in a, a state of readiness so that when they have an idea, they can explore it more fully. 
Oh, well, that, that sounds really cool. So just one more time, tell us the name of the game and, and also uh, if people can buy that, because I, I think I, I need a coffee. <laughs> it's, it's called mycelium, which I thought was a perfect metaphor for the way the brain works. Um, uh, the mycelium, of course, the, the root network of the mushroom um, and the stuff of nightmares. I know you like stuff of nightmares and we've probably talked about this before. Um, the oldest and largest living organism in the world is a mycelium in Oregon that is is three and a half square miles in area. It's one and a half miles across and two and a half miles long. Um, and it's somewhere between eight and 10,000 years old. And you, you never see it except through small mushrooms that grow up through trees. So it's the stuff of nightmares, but also the stuff that shows connective potential. Um, so and yes, and you can get, you can buy it on my website. Fantastic. I'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, right. Well, you do so much, but there's a few things I wanted to also ask about. So you were there talking about the squats and the lifting before you go run a race and you run races and you do um, <laughs> lifting. And you actually have another book called Lift, which is based around strength training, which I also do and love. But the book is also yes. about attitude. And you've uh, changed your focus in your career, but you've also changed your physical shape <laughs> <laughs> quite dramatically. Uh, those people who, and you do have some kind of before and after photos on, on your have. website. Should I send you some before and after photos to put yeah, on? Yeah, some, some of them I have clothes on. So yeah. <laughs> Yes, no, those ones, those would be better. But I, I find it interesting because I feel like so often we are brain people. You know, we, we, we're we all focused yeah. on our brain and we love the mind and we love all that. And and then uh, sometimes we neglect our bodies or we do things that don't make things optimum. But talk about what triggered your physical transformation. It was really simply last spring. It was realising that, that being the size I was would, would put me at higher risk of complications if I caught COVID. Ah, so was, well, that's a good one. <laughs> um, it, was, it was pragmatic. And I was 19 stone at the time. <clears throat> I was, it was really strange because I was quite fit. I had, I started my transformation, I guess, in my mid forties. Um, I took up ultra running, but I'd never really lost weight. So I was one of those people I was, I thought of myself as really quite fit. I could run 100 kilometres, which probably a lot of people in their mid-40s couldn't. But I was still clearly, clearly out of shape. And then I made, I say I made the conscious decision in, in sort of April last year. No, not last year anymore, is it? It's now April, two years ago, gosh. April 2020. Um, 2020. Mm. Um, and then over the course of the next 18 months, I lost six stone very, very slowly by introducing several sort of sustainable changes in my life but of course because I never do anything quite normally I wanted to set myself some physical challenges as well so I so I made I made lifting and running at the heart of that transformation so but, but I, I guess why this is also important is how does physical health and lifestyle practices underpin creativity because I think you link these things quite well in your writing it's okay. So, so the model, the way I think, the way I think of it is is what I call the jacquard. If you know the jacquard loom, which is is one of the ways that people weave carpets, and the way a jacquard loom works is that you have lots of different colours representing the different colours in the carpet, and the backing at any one time say five of the six colours will form the backing, but one of them will be pulled to the fore. Um, and form the main colour of the pattern of the carpet or the fabric. And this is sort of how I view training my mind, training my body, is this process of keeping all... It goes back to what we were saying earlier about, about not having any one focus, keeping lots of things in balance together. So at any one time, I will be training myself for endurance, speed and strength. And I'll also be training my mind for things like speed reading and speed cubing, but also for memory and creativity. So all of those I'll be training at any one time, but it's sort of ticking along in the background. And at any one time, I will be training one thing really seriously with a view to try and get better. Um, and it feeds on another principle in creativity, which is that the power of our, our knowledge isn't, it's not what we think of as 
the sum of everything we know. So it's not everything we know added up together. It's it's more of the product of what we know. So that, that working knowledge, useful knowledge is more about, it's more about everything multiplied together rather than everything added up. So I'm a big fan of the idea of compounding um, exponential improvement and focusing on lots of things having a multiplicative effect rather than additive effect. So I'm very much not a fan of the marginal gains idea. I'm much more of a fan of the, the idea that if you focus on lots of things at the same time, the, sum, the, the whole can be more than the sum of its parts. I love that. I love this multiplier idea. I, I'm totally with you. And I, I've been lifting more, I wouldn't say more seriously, but as in I, I have a trainer and twice a week we are lifting and we're focusing yeah. on becoming stronger. And I love it. And it feels really good. And I mean, it, it almost feels like it is a multiplier in terms of energy, but are there yeah. also sort of neurochemical things that help us with you know coming on to mental health like exercise and mental health are quite tightly wound together in many ways and it's, it's very individual and I don't like universalizing because I think a lot of people you know the, the memes about give up your medicine go out into nature which I think is sort of <laughs> irresponsible <laughs> irresponsible yeah um, but but I think for me yes it, it's it has definitely been the case it's what I, I would call my fitness and my strength are, are what I would call core or baseline changes that have enabled many more changes. Part of it is is the energy, as you mentioned. Part of it is confidence. Um, There are also physiological benefits, like benefits to bone density and resting heart rate and things like that, which and getting blood flow to the brain, helping your oxygenation of the blood it helps the heart work more efficiently so there are all sorts of things like that that mean that if you're fitter and stronger it it helps you then to have more time and do other things more efficiently and then that starts to feed into it you can then you can then automate more your processes can be more effective and that creates even more time which you can use to create more benefits and so on and it it becomes a virtuous loop so you need to be careful and do, especially at, at my age, and not push things too hard and, and not get injured because consistency is the absolute key. Well, and that in itself, consistency is the key and also taking a longer time. I mean, I, I, for, a, for Americans listening, you were around 265 pounds. Yes. And now you're around 180 pounds. Yes. I think it's it's around that, there. That, that sounds pretty much a spot on, yes. Mm, but it took you 18 months, which for yes. many people is, is actually uh, a long time. But for other people, yes. it's no time at all. It's like, whoa, that's crazy <laughs> that you <laughs> that you manage that. But I always feel like this, uh, the idea of doing things slowly, consistency, yeah. longevity in the market. You know, we like we were talking about, we met each other online in the early days of when we were on Twitter, probably 2009 2010 and that's probably when we met online but you and I have both been doing creative stuff for many many years now and it feels like health physical health is the same as a writing career in that you don't just wake up one morning and go yeah I'm just gonna run 100 kilometers today yeah you know so you do you might wake up and decide that you're going to do that but you don't Mm. actually go and go and do it (laughs) yeah you don't do it that day but how do we commit because I mean physical health again it's it's like writing you have to commit to it and be consistent and there's no real shortcuts is there how have you stuck to this what what keeps you going the the key for me is it's one of those interesting things and you're right and there's the really interesting fact that I've come across in a lot of places is that People who get into shape and, and lose weight of those only, only 5% will, will still be in shape five years later. And that's a quite alarming figure. Mm. So you, you have to do something quite drastic to be, be in that 5%. The key for me has been not to do anything that requires willpower. And I think that's that's quite hard for people to get their heads around. And that there is, I think, as you know, because I worked with you on a chapter of one of your books, on, on this, there is a lot of bad information out there in the wellness space. And if there's bad information out there in the wellness space on mental health and so on, it's even worse with fitness. There is an awful lot of promoting quick fixes and things that require willpower. And the short answer is that if, if something requires willpower, you're not going to be able to do it for the rest of your life because life gets in the way. And at some point, something else needs your willpower. 
So one of the things, I have quite a lot of natural advantages. I love exercise. A lot of people don't. I also have a body that's, that's despite everything I've thrown at it, the myriad truck fulls of pasties and so on over the years, <laughs> um, it still lets me do stuff. Uh, and most people who are my age, that might not be the case. I'm in my 50s, yes. I turned 50, I turned 50 um, last, a couple of months ago. And I'm also quite lucky that I like lots of food. But I, I followed the principle of losing weight by, by eating more rather than eating less because that's a very good way of avoiding having to the willpower to say no, just just say more to, to other things. So I, the, it's the principle of eating low-calorie dense foods and eating an awful lot of them. So I will eat literally for some meals, I'll, I'll have, as my side dish, I'll have a kilo of salad um, or something. Or and this sounds, probably sounds disgusting, but something like half a kilo of sprouts. Oh, I love sprouts. I love sprouts as well. <laughs> um, so yes, that sort of thing. And then I, I don't deny myself anything. So I still, someone said to me on Twitter when I said this, they say, well, what happens if you want carbs? And I say, well, I, I eat carbs if I want them. So I eat as much as I want, but because I'm eating a high volume of um, low calorie dense foods, I'm, I'm always full. So I don't get hungry. And mm, that, that's I'm... really, really key I think so it, there's no willpower there's no good pushing through these places where you feel really hungry um and this and is individual really tasty food yeah so. yeah but th- this is individual differences again I I feel because yes. um I personally uh, find that eating a more sort of keto low carb then I'm not hungry whereas if I eat a kilo of sprouts I'm really really hungry so again it's completely different on there's so many variations and like you said there's so many rules a lot of bad rules but like you said the key is you can't use willpower for long-term change what you have to do is almost trick yourself and hack your hack your behavior so that you do it because you want to do it so you have to find whatever it is that that works to motivate yourself and you can't white knuckle the change that you've done or you can't white knuckle a writing career either can you no no you can it's like I think people think that this will happen to the people they see as overnight successes so people have this view that writing you sort of you come out of nowhere and this this it's the same in all creative arts I think people don't see that that it's actually it's just years and years of consistent slog and you can't do the consistent slog um unless you actually just really really love it and you don't necessarily have to love it to start with but you can come to love it it was an interesting thing that I, I read reading. I think it was a biography of Judith Polgar, who's a famous chess prodigy, who was, it sounds really awful. She was subject to an experiment by, by her father um, to try and, what does it take to create a chess prodigy and or to create a prodigy? And the thing that emerged that, that they all said at the end is that if you want to be really, really good at something, you just have to love it. You can't force it. You can't do it by force or by simple coercion or willpower alone. It has to be something you love. And I think that's the key for writing as well. Yes. Yeah, so talking of individual differences, you talk about being neurodiverse and you work with a lot of organisations on mental health and disability issues. So what is neurodiversity in particular, I guess, as it relates to the writing community and, and how can we improve our writing ecosystem for people who are neurodiverse? Okay, so, so, so I'm, I'm, I would say neurodivergent rather than neurodiverse because neurodiverse sort of implies a, a group. A group, a group would be neurodiverse and a person would be neurodivergent, I think. Mm-hmm. So, to put it. so so I'm ADHD. You never guess from the fact that I struggle to stick with a genre. Um, and uh, dyspraxic, which has a lot of overlap with ADHD and is also really interesting because I think that's one of the reasons I've got so into lifting uh, because I've had to work on my, my spatial, my awareness of myself in space. And it's something you don't necessarily associate with physical activity. Um, but the first person I ever met who, who was openly dyspraxic was, was a bodybuilder when I was teaching, was work, one of my students, uh, and also bipolar. So I think the way it affects me 
is a lot of, and this comes down to what we've been saying, a lot of general advice doesn't work. And I think the writing community loves its rules. It loves to say things like you have to stick with one genre, you have to write every day, you have to not only write every day, but write in the morning rather than in the afternoon for some reason. Um, so there, there are all sorts of things that we're told we have to do. And if your brain is slightly wired slightly differently, you, you can't necessarily do that. And it will also, going back to what I was saying in the last in answer to your last question, it will take the joy out of writing. So part of my journey has been to find ways of working consistently that work for me with rules that work for my brain rather than things that I'm told to do. And I think my approach to, to skipping around amongst genres and skipping around amongst mediums and also trying lots of new things has been key to that. So I think, I guess my the way it works for me is that people would probably recognise my voice as it were through my writing. Even if I write in different genres, it's all clearly me because I write slightly, quite oddly. Um, and I think that's something we can, I see quite a lot of writers doing and doing really well is, is, is it's almost the, the Ian Banks model, isn't it? Um, of not just working in one area, but being distinctive across the areas you work in. And I think that works for my kind of brain much better than trying to funnel myself into just one, one focus. And there's a lot of call, obviously, very importantly, for the the writing and publishing to be far more diverse. And mm. of course, race and gender and sexuality are important parts of that. But I think your discussion of uh, neurodiversity and I guess more of an acceptance, again, of individual differences and the fact that yeah. people are different and different doesn't have to mean bad and doesn't have to mean you know wrong. And in fact, perhaps in a more creative world that we would like to live in, it's better. I mean, we need diversity in every sense of the word. And so I guess we're we just asking people to be more accepting of individual differences, I guess. Yeah, I think, I mean, publishing has its has a huge amount of problems. I, I've been on several podcasts actually talking about this. I don't know if you know Kat Mitchell's study on disability in publishing. No. Um, which is, I would recommend it to everyone. Um, it's really quite damning. And a lot of the issues are the same as the general diversity issues across the piece. It's forcing people into practices that we think of as being just the way it's done, but that actually there's... And so when a scene is dominated by people who are, shall we say, homogenous, um, mm. by a group that's rather homogenous, things become the standard way of doing things. And if something is, becomes the standard way of doing things, it takes on this quality of almost become like, like a natural law. So the idea that you have to write a thousand words a day, for example, becomes sort of, it's a given. And the idea you have to write in a certain genre all the time is a given. This sort of write, publish, repeat model is, is yeah, that's the way it has to be done. And I think that's one of the main barriers to diversity is this, we've taken conventions and given them the status of laws rather than seeing them as conventions and seeing that other conventions might be this, a different way of getting to the same result, which is a compelling story, because that's what we, we all want to do is we all want to tell compelling stories. Mm. Um, at, the end, at the end of the day, we are all about transporting our readers to somewhere that even whether it's for the rest of their life or for a few minutes, takes them out of themselves and makes their lives better and there are so many different ways of doing that um, that it just seems plain odd that we would assume there's only one or two different ways of doing it absolutely but there's also this desire for the the hack or the rule or yeah. one way we can make it and unfortunately yes. that is also not true uh, but I, yeah. I do want to I mean what I like about the idea of diversity let's circle back to you because we'll, you and I could definitely talk forever but I do want to circle back, circle back on the VR and AR side of things so yeah. virtual reality augmented reality which you talked about near the beginning and we're both fans of technology as independent authors in different yeah. ways we definitely don't agree on everything 
But when we think about neurodiversity and also physical diversity and, and how you could portray yourself in a future way when we don't look at each other physically. I mean, you and I, we know each other, but we're not yeah. looking at each other right now. <laughs> this is an audio only interview. And if we were doing this in a space where either one of us could change our voices and use a different avatar in a virtual reality world, how are people going to portray themselves? And, and what do you see about VR and AR? Why are you interested in it? This is something I find absolutely fascinating. Um, the use of virtual reality for for me, that I get, so there are two aspects to it. One is the storytelling aspect. That, that as a storyteller, I find virtual reality absolutely fascinating because it gives me more world building possibilities. And for creativity in particular, which is about connections, one of the things that excites me is that technology has finally got to the space where, if you say, for example, the standard question, what hum, come up with as many as many uses as you can for a paperclip. Virtual reality means that finally you can actually physically try these things out using virtual reality. So you can take the creative problem solving into the virtual space and treat it as though it were the real space and do things that you would otherwise have to have either a lab or changes to the rules of physics to enable you to do. So there, there is massive creative potential in that. But also, yes, this, this question of how we represent ourselves. So I don't know how much you you or your your listeners are, are aware of the sort of the, the, the cyborg movement, which is Tell us part, about it. part of the transhuman, post-human movement. Um, it's part of the disability community it comes out of. The idea that, that a lot of us already rely on, on augmentation and augmentation is part of our identity. So whether that's prosthesis, whether it's a wheelchair, whether it's medication, or whether it's simply the fact that a lot of us have to mask in society because a lot of the behaviours that we we would otherwise have aren't, aren't socially acceptable. So we, we are already augmented. We're already not simply just the atoms that make up our physical bodies and the neurons or whatever that make up our minds. And, and virtual reality takes that a little bit further and it enables us to have more autonomy over the way that we are, that we portray ourselves, that we are subjective. Um, and I, I find that the idea that we can, almost that it will become more so more universal that people do this is, is an exciting idea. Mm. That, that people are finally coming around to this idea that, that actually no one is what they see. Because we've had this for too long that we've, we sort of assume that when we see someone, when we talk to them, there's almost this, this is something that we, 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 both, we both studied theology and we've done a bit of philosophy that, that comes with this thing. We assume that what you see is what you get when you meet someone and talk to them. And that's quite clearly not true if you think about it philosophically, but, but it seems true because we seem as though we're having these interactions that are direct and not mediated. And what technology does is makes the mediation clear. And I think there is a real value to that because it makes us think much more about who we are separately from the person we portray and who the person we're speaking to is separately from the person they portray. And therefore, it's, it makes us think about things in a more complex way. And I think that that has to be a good thing. Mm. No, I do too. And... I'm looking forward to this as well. And I think quite a lot about how I will portray myself when this happens, when we meet in a, as avatars in a space, yeah. you know, how, like I always talk about being a bit of a vanilla goth. Like I, I would love to be covered in tattoos. I really would. But part of me does not want to do that in my real life, but it may be that my avatar in the virtual space has tattoos and maybe those tattoos change every time I, I change my mind about what it, I want those to mean on the, in the symbolism and all of that. Yeah, I, they don't, I they think don't have about four that. hours of needles, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And also I, I could change them a lot more easily in, yeah. in a VR space, but um, I know a lot of authors are, I mean, think, you know, there's so much misinformation. There's so much negativity about all of this stuff. And we, we are talking about this in a sort of, not a meta 
slash Facebook way in a, in a bigger uh, concept. But one of the things we were just uh, mentioning before the call was the sort of idea of brain implants, which to many people are very scary, but we are seeing technology. I mean, Elon Musk and the Neuralink program, which uh, are sort of helping people trapped in a physical body move into a different realm. And, and I know there's some sort of mind reading technology that they're looking at. So what do you think about this quite so you know th- this frontier i guess well i i guess it, it's i'm ambivalent but in a completely positive I, i'm a positive ambivalent so so i'm ambivalent in the sense that and I, we were talking about this earlier that there are lots of fantastic things that inevitably get hijacked and i think this is probably one of them i i love the potential i think as someone who has spent a lot of my life on medication the idea of that, oh, no, you mustn't mess with that. Uh, it just goes out of the window straight away because I'm used to my my mind and my body being messed with by medication. So having something in my brain doesn't feel... I've had something in my brain ever since I've started taking antidepressants, as it were, so it doesn't feel necessarily something scary. And as uh, much as I don't necessarily want to, to quote Elon Musk in a way that, oh, that's so deep and so profound, that he's he's right when he says we are already cyborgs. He says, we, we already have mobile phones or whatever. Um, so we already use technology to improve our brains. And we have been doing ever since we've started writing things down, for example. Writing something down is using an external technology because you can't hold it in your brain. So I don't see the, the sort of the qualitative problem that a lot of people see with this. I do think that it's quite scary that it's an expensive technology that will inevitably widen inequalities because that tends to be what happens with expensive technologies. But I think I wish it didn't. And I I find the whole idea of biohacking in general really quite exciting. And I know it's quite problematic and a lot of people are very worried about it. But I think the part of me that gets excited by technology overrides that and wants to know what happens and wants to be part of exploring what happens. It sort of comes back to, I think, if we last did it, it had a podcast together in 2013, we may have talked about American Mary. Oh, I can't remember. Because <laughs> that, that, I'm sure, I'm sure it must be one of your favourite films because it's, it's so you. I don't watch horror films. I only read horror books. <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> so American Mary is about, it's about, about a med student who um, earns money by, by performing body, mod, body modification. And that whole the whole body modification moving into biohacking sphere really excites me in terms of what the possibilities are. And I guess, I guess it goes with the fact that I do competitive mind sports, for example, that it, it simply feels like part of training. I, I want to see what the limits of the human brain are. I feel as though the, the, trying to have this idea of you've got to keep it real or you've got to keep it natural or you've got to keep it the way nature intended is, we are already so far beyond that point. I wish we could just get over it and, and sort of find out what the limits are and what the possibilities are. Uh, I And I think also you and I are both very curious people and curiosity will always win over yeah. the, um, yes, there are always doubts, but curiosity ca- comes first. And, and you mentioned there biohacking and body modification. Of course, you helped me with my book, Desecration and, and Delirium and, uh, on the mental health side. Yes. Uh, but I do want to just circle back. Uh, I know we're out of time. But I just can't stop asking this question. <laughs> um, you talked about a qualitative problem of using some kind of augmentation. So I get this. So using AI, tools like GPT-3 as a writer, which to me is like a collaborative, creative, interesting, curious tool that I can use. I'm the person directing it. But people say, that's not fair. That's wrong. That's unethical. We shouldn't do this kind of thing. Do you think that's just a sort of fear of technology or is it this qualitative problem like we're human, therefore we're best? I, I think there is a qualitative, qualitative problem that people think that he, human exceptionalism, I think, is, is an issue. It's an issue within the, that is going to come more and more to the fore, both through the development of AI, but also through issues around climate. The whole question of, of what place does humanity have in the world and is it a place that's set apart from everything else? Um, I think there is a lot of. I think for a lot of writers, they feel issues around copyright, probably still. 
they're nervous about the fact that AI is trained on data sets that includes their words, and they're not getting any benefit from that or perceived benefit from that. I think this catches up with something that we've probably talked about many times, which I think is that copyright law still hasn't even begun to think about the digital age, let alone caught up with it. Mm. Um, and I think this is going to get more and more the case as, as AI develops, not just in terms of does AI have copyright, does the person who programmed the AI have copyright, but in terms of the data sets that feed the AI to do things. I think also people are just worried about automation and they're worried about being automated. And I think some of the narratives from when I was a student around chess, for example, have sort of haven't helped the, the idea that once you reach the singularity, this sort of idea when, when, he, when AI overtakes us, then that will be it and we'll be redundant. And people think that that sort of happened with chess when, when Gary Kasparov lost. And that just isn't the case. And I think chess has actually become, and, and Go more recently, so everyone who hasn't watched Alpha Go, the story of the development of Google DeepMind's development of the AI that finally mastered the game of Go. These are really good examples of how humans and machines work together. We can learn more about things that feel deeply human by having machines that can also do them in ways that we find both technically accomplished, but also surprising. And I think in the fields of chess and go, we, we have already seen people who are really quite heavily on the, the this is an art side of the debate say, well, actually, I, we've got this these games that have been with us for thousands of years, and we have already learned something mm. about the essence of these games that we wouldn't have learned if machines hadn't started playing. And I think that's that will happen with writing too. So yeah. I think people are frightened that they will be automated, but I think they needn't be. No, me, me too. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, it circles back to creativity, which is what, what do you want to achieve? You know, certainly at the moment, the machines don't have their own desires. <laughs> we're, we're the ones with the desires. And then we're interested in the technologies and different ways of, of making that happen, of putting these things in the world. So, oh, my goodness, we're going to have to have another conversation about that, I think. <laughs> we'll, so yes. we'll, we'll be back in part two at some point, Excellent. and it won't be another, what, eight years. We'll do it before then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find you and everything you do online um they can find me mainly through through the website rogan terrorbang which is uh my creative thinking company website brilliant and, and everything is linked out from there they can also find my my fiction books should they ever wish to um are all available on on online stores fantastic and, and my poetry they can find on youtube if they put me into youtube they will come up with a skateboarder and a guitar player and a some strange person doing poetry which is me <laughs> brilliant well thanks so much for your time dan that was great thank you so i hope you found the interview with dan interesting and inspiring in the way he combines so many things into his life and i know this is so important i feel like we compartmentalize things and we have these rules and these uh, myths like writing fiction is somehow more creative than non-fiction or lifting weights is only for boneheaded alpha males, <laughs> which clearly neither Dan or I are. And in fact, I wanted to mention because we talked about lifting in the interview. I did my birthday deadlift last week at 65 kgs and uh, that I haven't actually lifted on a bar. I lift other things. <laughs> I have been lifting other things, deadlift, deadlifting other things like big kettlebells and banded stuff and whatever. But I did my first bar um, this week at 65 kg. But it wasn't just one lift. I was, I'm still in, um, I have some uh, muscle feeling at the moment because I worked my way up from 45 kg in 5 kg in increments in sets of five <laughs> and then three. As I, so I actually did a ton of deadlifts last week on my birthday. It was like, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to take, because I'm taking my health very, very seriously this year. I need to claw back what I lost uh, when I got COVID. And there are so many myths and rules and things we constrain ourselves with. And so let's, let's be more like Dan and question assumptions and break out of what people want us to do and what we set ourselves, uh, the boundaries we set ourselves as well. So I certainly really enjoyed that interview. 
So this week I have some in between episodes. Like I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of co- content coming. I'm going to put my video NFTs for authors as an audio on the feed. So you'll get that. You'll be able to listen to that. Then I have an interview with Elle Griffin, who uses Substack and also NFTs to make money. And she definitely questions assumptions. So that's that's going to be really interesting. Next Monday on the usual show, I'll be back on writing craft because I know many of you, all of us, yeah, we want to do the writing craft and we want to do the business. Uh, that's what this show focuses on. So I'll be talking to Nikesh Shukla about Your Story Matters. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.